Vladimir Propp was a member of a group of very important critics called the Russian Formalists. And he studied a book called the Afanasev Collection of Rus Russian folk tales. The term folk tale is for Russians the same as the term fairy tale for many speakers of English. In 1927, he published a book called The Morphology of the Folktale, based on this study, and reported one of the most astonishing discoveries in all of cultural history. He discovered the universality of the structure of true oral folktales, or as we would say, if they were truly orally composed, fairy tales. These were precisely the kinds of stories the Grimm brothers had purported to publish. Prop's discovery included four theorems. That's his term for what he discovered. First, he says, the functions of characters serve as stable, constant elements in a tale, independent of how and by whom they are fulfilled. This is really an astonishing ast statement. According to his introduction, he read these tales in order. There are about 400 in the Afanasev collection. And by the time he had finished reading the first 10, he already had every one of these functions found. The rest of the reading merely confirmed that these common elements, these things that characters do, happen again and again and again. The second theorem is that the number of functions that is known to the fairy tale is limited. That is to say, you can't just keep making them up. In fact, there are 32. A large number, but not larger, for instance, than the number of pronouns that we know how to use quite comfortably as native speakers of English. Excuse me. Not larger than the number of prepositions that we know how to use quite easily as native speakers of English. The third theorem is that the sequence of functions is always identical. The fourth theorem is really the inference one can make from the first three, that all fairy tales are of one type in regard to their structure. Let me see if I can make this clearer. Prop says we have this set number of maximum functions. One of them, absentation, is obligatory. In fact, several of them are obligatory. You must have them. Absentation is the child leaving the parent, or the parent dying, or the child uh, wandering off. In some way, the viewpoint character becomes absent from the authority figure who should have been protecting the viewpoint character. Absentation is an obligatory function, and there are many. There are other functions that are optional. You can have them or not have them. But if you have them, think of them as numbered from absentation right through to the ultimate consolation. If you have them and think of them as numbered, whichever functions occur, whether they are obligatory or optional, will occur in their order. Now, there are some small exceptions to this. For instance, the leaving of home, departure, and return are optional. But if there is a departure, there must be a return. Right? In addition, some functions, according to prop, can triplicate. So there is the function, for example, of testing the protagonist. But in some tales, instead of the protagonist having one test, the protagonist has three tests. It turns out that Prop was wrong in one tiny detail. It is not universally true that those functions triplicate. Had Prop said that these functions multiply, he would have been universally correct. It turns out that in Western culture, tales, functions that can multiply, triplicate. In Southern 
uh, Asian and North American cultures, native North American cultures, tales, functions that can multiply, quadruplicate. And in East Asian cultures, they duplicate. But within those cultures, the number, the multiplier, is constant. And in all other regards, Prop turns out to be right. For true oral tales, there is a single known function. There is, in other words, in the basis of fairy tales, something that tells us about the basic narrative structure that all human beings share, regardless of how far apart their cultures may be. Prop laid the foundation for the study of the founding tales of diverse cultures. Albert Lord, an American professor, in a famous book called The Singer of Tales, demonstrated how one could have oral composition of works like The Odyssey and Beowulf. He showed, taking a hint from this notion of functions from Prop, that you could have a complicated narrative in which one knew only the basic nuggets, as it were, of the story in order. But then one could have sort of standardized verbal formulae, like the Wine Dark Sea or Wily Odysseus. Oral tales were collected in the Balkans. Lord went and listened to people apparently sing epics, things that would take nights around the campfire to recount. All of the people sitting around believed that the singer was giving the same tale verbatim that they had heard on other occasions previously. But Lord was able to actually tape record these, transcribe them, and discovered that while the nuggets were the same and the formulae were the same, within the structure that the rhythm of the singing created, the singer was able to make variations from telling to telling of the same tale. They struck the hearers as being the same, but they were not identical. They were merely the same in nuggets, like props functions, and formulae, certain verbal structures. Using Lord's insight into scribal manipulation, that is, how it is that the written down versions have changed what the oral composition was, and Prop's discovery of universal structure, we can see that the most successful of Grimm's fairy tales follow the oral tradition. We could compare one that does not with one that does to make this clear. If we read a highly modified that is scribally changed tale, like The Table, the Stick, and the Ass, we'll see why it is that while we all know the name Cinderella or the Frog Prince or Rapunzel, we don't think so quickly of The Table, the Stick, and the Ass. This tale is one in which a father has a goat, and he sends each of his sons, it's triplicated, one after another, to bring the goat out to pasture. In each case, the goat lies and says that she has not been properly fed, and the father becomes angry, and eventually he drives his sons away. When the sons are away, each of them has an adventure, a journey and return. And in each adventure, each son is tested, and each one passes the test and acquires a magical table that can lay out food, a magical stick that can beat people, hence protect you, and a magical ass that can spit out gold coins. They feel quite good, and as is always the case in fairy tales, it's the youngest son who saves the day. He comes back with the most important of these and frees his brothers who have been kept in a village nearby because the people were angry at their magical activities. He brings his brothers back home to the father, and they explain what really happened with the goat. The father becomes angry at having been fooled by the goat and drives the goat out. The goat then has adventures. Three, the goat has been shaved by the father as a sign of her disgrace. She is attacked by different animals. And by the third attack, that of bees, she is driven off forever. And that's the end of the story. So, is it a story about a goat? 
Is it a story about fathers and sons? In fact, you can think of this as three separate stories. There's the story of the goat who makes believe she won't eat. There's the story of the sons who come ultimately to be able to have power and return and take over their home. And then there's the story of the goat who is being punished by the other animals. By interconnecting these, by submerging one within the other, what the Grimm brothers did with the tales that they collected was produce a story that they may have liked literarily, but it violates the fundamental propian structure. We can see the work of the scribal hand destroying the elegant simplicity of the propian structure. Now, by comparison, we have the Frog Prince. Now, the Frog Prince also turns out to be a learned story. The Frog Prince, by the way, is not the story that most of us tend to remember about kissing a frog and having him turn into a prince. It begins with the princess, who goes out into the woods to play with her golden ball, and she is so beautiful that the very sun stops and looks down at her in admiration. The sun being the oldest symbol of a monotheistic god, the golden ball being a symbol of God, and she throw as well as, of course, royalty, and she throws it up in the air, and she's playing catch with it, but she misses it and falls down into a well of water so deep that she cannot even see it. A frog nearby says, I will get you back your ball. If you will, be my playfellow. Let me eat at your plate and sleep in your bed. She agrees. He goes down into the water and comes back out with the ball. We remember, of course, that water is a sign of fertility. Frogs, because they can move from one realm to another, suggest the possibility of one kind of life transforming into another. But she really doesn't want the frog, so she takes the ball and she runs away. The frog hops after her. This is a retelling, in an interesting way, of the story of Atalanta, the story about a girl, a princess, who would not be willing to marry despite her father, the king, telling her that she must, unless a man could come along who could beat her in a foot race. Hippomenes is, is the beneficiary of the mercy of a goddess who tells him where she, he can find the golden apples of the Hebrides. He takes those golden apples, and as he runs through the forest, he drops first one, then another, triplicate. And Atalanta keeps stopping to pick up one after the other. So Hippomenes beats her back to the castle, and though she does not want to marry, the king says she must. All right, she must. But it turns out marriage agrees with her, and she's glad that she had to submit to authority. In the case of the frog prince, the frog hops back and comes into the castle after the princess. The king says, what is this? The princess explains what the frog is doing there, that she had made this promise, but the frog is ugly. The king says, no, no, you must fulfill your promise. So he hops up on the table and eats out of her plate. He's trying to be her playmate as well. And then after the meal, he hops after her to her bedroom. She takes one look at the frog, and in the Grimm's version, she picks him up and flings him against the wall, where he smashes and falls down, instantly transformed into a handsome prince. Seeing the prince in her bedroom, this all looks a little different to the princess, and they live happily ever after. Now, the story here follows an exact propian structure. It begins with the absentation of the princess from the prince, uh, from the king. It has a test. It has a magical uh, gift. It gives us both departure and return, and so on. Even though we can see, because of its connection with the ancient, ancient Roman Ovid and his description of the story of Atalanta, that this is a scribal change of the oral tale, it makes no difference. The tale persists, and its meaning stays with us. So, as long as we keep this structure, we know we can hang tremendously powerful meanings on them. Authority, who can tell you what to do, is clearly important in fairy tales. In Rapunzel, for example, the witch has authority. 
but she can be flouted because the heroine has fertility and the witch does not. In The Gallant Tailor, we have a youth, a young man, who's a liar, like the girl in The Three Spinsters. He kills seven, seven flies with one shot and is so puffed up with his own bravery that he embroiders a saying on his own belt that says, seven with one blow. He's taken to be a great killer, and he lies his way into a position in which ultimately he becomes a king. Why is he allowed to do that? Because he has youth. There's the story of Rumpelstiltskin. A miller's daughter claims to be able, she's lying, but she wants to get on the good side of the prince, to be able to spin straw into gold. She can't. But along comes a spirit of the woods, Rumpelstiltskin, who says, well, I'll do it for you if you like. But like the witch in Rapunzel says, but when you have a child, the child must be mine. He does spin the straw into gold. She does marry. She does have a child, but then she's unwilling to repay her part of the bargain. However, when she says, I would rather have something living than all of the things that are valuable that are not living, he relents and says, all right, you can keep the child if you can guess my name. Of course, he has a very unusual name. But one of the princesses, the queen, the queen to be, the princess's servants, follows him into the woods and hears him giving his own little speech about what his name may be. Actually, on the first two times that he comes back to the princess, she gets it wrong, but there's triplication. And on the third time, he, she has now been told what his name really is. She says his name, and he is so angry that he stamps his foot into the ground and drives himself into the ground where he dies. Why is it fair for Rumpelstiltskin to die for having done exactly what he said he would do and even giving the princess a second chance? It's not fair. The morals of fairy tales aren't that the world is fair. The morals of the fairy tales are that if you're youthful, strong, beautiful, and all the things that that stands for, meaning beloved of your parents, that you will succeed and others will not. Authority can be flouted if you have the power to do so. If not, as the princess in The Frog Prince did not until she became married to a prince and able to move up herself, you had best listen. When Cinderella has no doubt about her fairy godmother helping her, we understand that. It's a godmother. But in works of imagination intended for adults, for example, in Hamlet, the situation is not nearly so clear. Remember, the opening scene of Hamlet shows Hamlet on the battlements of the castle confronting the ghost of his father, who tells him how uneasily he rests because he's been murdered. And most of the rest of the play is Hamlet trying to figure out how, in what way he can, if indeed he should, avenge the death of his father. The fairy godmother comes to help the child. The ghostly godfather comes to tell the child what he must do. In the adult work, the imagination is equally strongly involved. But understanding what to do with it is no longer so simple because the world of adults is not so simple as we at least would like to have children be able to believe their world may be. The Grimm brothers consciously built their stories on this universal structure. Their aim was to establish a German culture. The German culture ultimately led to a German state. What do these tales tell us? They tell us that beautiful people deserve better fates than ugly people, all things being equal. They also tell us that the world is a sexist domain. Consider the difference between the story of Hansel and Gretel and the story of Cinderella. In the story of Hansel and Gretel, most people don't recall that there are really two trips that the children make into the woods. 
after Hansel has heard that their stepmother wants to abandon them because there's not enough food to eat. On the first trip, Hansel leaves a trail of flints, and they follow those flints back. On the second trip, they leave a trail of breadcrumbs. However, the birds eat the breadcrumbs. It is because the birds eat the breadcrumbs that the children are left in the woods, where they encounter the female witch, who has an attractive house made of food, but the food is only a lure because she wants to make the children into food herself. Why is it that the flints worked and the breadcrumbs did not? We get the answer by looking at Cinderella. In Cinderella, after the stepmother throws the lentils into the ashes, the birds come down and pick the lentils out for Cinderella. They don't eat them, though they could eat them as easily as they could eat breadcrumbs. Cinderella is female, and food is the domain of females, universally, in Grimm's fairy tales. Flints are used to strike fire in a rifle. That is the domain of males. In Little Red Cap, or Little Red Riding Hood, as it's more usually known in English, the huntsman comes and aims his gun at the wolf, but thinks someone may be alive in there. When he picks up scissors to cut open the wolf's belly, he's using a female implement, and when Red and her grandmother come out, we have an ironic kind of birth where they then become the fertile, powerful figures and undo that birth when Red sows the stones into the wolf's belly. We have male domain and female domain. And if males do what males should do, they will succeed. If females do what females should do, they will succeed. But if they try to work in each other's domains, they will fail. The Frog Prince is not a frog. Our memory that the kiss turns the frog into a prince is false. Not only is there no kiss, but rather an act of violence, but the prince, we, the frog we need to understand, had already been a human being. The frog is not turned into a prince. He is turned back into a prince. The sign of his fundamental humanity is that he speaks. And in fact, in the world of fairy tales, we have equally well a set of distinctions, just like that between male and female, that lets us know what should count as human and what should not. So that sometimes we will have talking animals in the same tale in which other animals do not speak. There's one tale in which a mute horse is slaughtered by his rider to feed a, a society of ants, the king of whom begs him for help. We know that those who are of us deserve our help. Those who are not can be used. The world of Grimm's fairy tales is, in fact, somewhat brutal. As we look at these tales, we have to understand that they can be used to shape many morals. Males, in general, are better than females. The way in which Cinderella achieves her consolation is not only by moving up socially, but by submitting to the authority of a man. We know that the higher social orders are better than the low, lower social orders. We even know that life in the city is better than life in the country. With all of this being integrated into tales that hang on a fundamental structure that all human beings share, the question arises, what can you do with this? The Grimm brothers, of course, decided to make Germany, as it were. In their own lifetime, besides publishing three volumes of, of 
stories that together came to somewhat over 200. They also published a single version of their tales, a small select group, their favorites. And in that group, they had a tale called The Jew Among the Thistles. This particular tale is one that got dropped out in the late 19th century when people published one volume editions of Grimm's fairy tales and then was brought back in again during the Nazi period and has since been expunged again from one volume editions of Grimm although you can find it easily in the complete works the story of the Jew among the thistles goes like this there was we are told an upright hard-working kind-hearted servant who gives a dwarf the only money that he has. The dwarf rewards him by giving this kind-hearted, upright servant a magic fiddle that can set anyone who hears it dancing. The Jew, not even a Jew, but in the Grimm's telling, the Jew, happens upon the servant and tries to cheat him. The servant throws him into a briar patch and starts fiddling. The Jew has no choice but to dance, and he dances and dances until his beard is torn, his clothing and flesh are streaming with tatters, and he calls out in a phrase that the Grimm brothers seem to think was quite fun to listen to, Oy vey, which of course is German. The servant leaves the Jew, goes into town, but the Jew comes after him and complains to the justice that he has been tormented by that lad. There is a trial, and the lad is convicted. As he is standing on the gallows, he begins to fiddle again, and the Jew begins to dance. And everyone sees that, in fact, the Jew did something wrong, and for that, the lad is left off the gallows and the Jew is taken, put in his place and killed. Now, we've seen often in Grimm's fairy tales that our idea of justice may not be everybody's idea of justice. That an attempt to cheat that fails ultimately leads to a happy idea that the attempted cheater should be killed um, seems entirely wrong. While the actual robbery that um, the upright servant performs by taking away the Jew's money with him um, goes unpunished. However, the Grimm brothers didn't really collect oral folk tales. The Grimm brothers were professors, and we all know how professors rely on the help of friendly graduate students they sent their graduate students out to the farms to try to collect tales, and their graduate students wrote them down as best they could. There were no tape recorders in those days. In fact, shorthand hadn't yet been invented. The Grimm brothers themselves went to the neighborhood they lived in, and they talked to a number of housewives, middle-class housewives, who told them the stories they sort of remembered. And Jacob was in charge of this collection activity. He then took versions of the stories and gave them to Wilhelm, who went through the repetitions that we would naturally expect and tried to come up with single versions of the tales, which he then made to sound good and published them. Now, he didn't just use these not actually orally collected tales. He also used other existing sources of tales, like Charles Perrault's late 17th century version of fairy tales. And we have found in the Grimm Brothers Library a volume of Italian folk tales, within which there is a story not of the Jew among the thistles, but the friar among the thistles. The Grimm Brothers took a story they already knew, and instead of having it be a story that attacked the authority, the perverted authority in the teller's view of the church used it to attack Jews. The Grimm brothers took fundamental realities of human imagination and used them to create stories that last through all of human history in such a way that collectively they teach sexism, they teach 
class stratification, and in fact, taught anti-Semitism. But they did this in such a way as to bind together a nation. The power of the imagination is limitless.